Oh, God, I wish I'd read instructions for a heat wave before this, Judy. Oh. Well, you should know better by now, falling asleep in the sun like that and right next to the fence. Ouch! Oh, that's cold. S sit still. I need to see your face now. There, that's better. How bad is it? Well, you won't look like adamant for too long. I'm sure those fence stripes will fade. OK, you're done. Ow! Right, on with the show. Meet award-winning novelist Maggie O'Farrell. She's taking us into that glorious summer of 76 and the famous, some would say infamous, heatwave. The air in the kitchen is like a solid entity filling the space, pushing Greta down into the floor. Only she would choose to bake bread in such weather. Maggie will share some top tips about writing. And just for you, exclusive to WH Smith, Maggie reads her favourite bit of her book. Tell us what titles you've enjoyed on the Richard and Judy Book Club. Find us on Facebook slash Richard and Judy Book Club. I think considering that she was only four and a half in 1976, her memories of that heat wave, which you and I were, were, were grown up when it was happening, are extraordinary. I mean, as she said in the interview, she does actually remember those days, though the standpipes. Fancy remembering that at four and a half. Um, and and the, that atmosphere that sort of... This was all new and anything could... Ha if, if, if we could have weather like this, then anything could happen. I think it's an amazing idea for a book because the fact of the matter is that if you lived through it, as you did and I did, um, although you never really think about it anymore, if anything brings it back to you, it was quite exceptional. I've never experienced anything like it before or since. Those few months of incredible heat, mm. really, day after day, all of us begging for rain, actually, and ironically. Not, and not just heat, but these cloudless skies. Uh, and as she herself says uh, in the interview that we, that we did with her, um, it lent the possibility that anything might happen. That if we could, if English weather could become continental weather, Grecian weather, North African weather, then what else might happen in this extraordinary summer? And as, as she said, people, people tell stories to her about what they were doing in '76. Those who were old enough to remember, and they were getting up to all sorts. There were affairs. Yeah. But, but the sinister thing about that heat wave, as I remember it, is, I mean, admittedly I was pregnant and therefore full of hormones and completely irrational, but on the other hand, um, the sinister thing about it was that some of us hated it, that we felt completely out of control, we felt the country mm. had gone completely out of control, the climate had gone completely out of control, and we genuinely wondered whether we can ever, were ever going to get back to good old British weather again. Yeah, you're right, there was a section of the population, and you were one of it, Judy, that got yeah, quite frightened. But anyway, it makes a very vivid, stark background to her story. And uh, like the best stories, it's about a missing person. You mm -hmm. know? Um, and you can't start with a better premise, and that's how this one starts. And we loved it. And Maggie O'Farrell, the author's with us now. Maggie, we loved it. Oh, we loved it. Thing. We loved it for, for, for many reasons. Um, but, but first and foremost, and that's just how the book opens, because you do set it in a summer that both... Judy and I remember, although we weren't together then, but you were far too young to remember. You were four in 1976? That's right, I was four, yeah. Well, actually, it forms the sort of bedrock of some of my earliest memories. I think that's Does why... Does it? Why? Yeah. Oh. Well, I was four, and we'd just moved from Ireland and... To, 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 to England? No, to, to, to South Wales. To South Wales, and of course, yeah. the southwest was the area that was worst hit, you know, mm. the whole yeah. sort of Dorset and Cornwall and Just South to explain, Wales. the heat wave started quite early in the summer and went on and on and on and on and yeah. on and on and on. It made the, the heat wave of this year look look like a, a blip. Nothing. nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, go on. So you're in South Wales. <laughs> yeah, so we just moved to South Wales from Ireland and, you know, this heat wave suddenly hit and I think as a child, you know, to me then it was just incredibly exciting, you know, because mm. there was no water coming out of the taps. We <laughs> couldn't have a bath. Mm. You know, any change in your life at that age is there so... There was a minister for water appointed, That's wasn't right, there? Yeah, I can't remember his name now. But Howell. 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 It's called Howell, you're right, yeah. Good memory. Oh, yeah. Fancy not remembering that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been really... Anyway, go on. <laughs> but we just had, you know, and it was all these strange things happened. So there was no water in the tap. We had to go to a standpipe which had appeared in the middle of our road mm. to collect our sort of daily allowance. And it was great because all the kids of the neighbourhood would collect there and all the mums would all have a chat and... What I, what, what I think is very clever about your choice of, of that summer to set the, the, as the backdrop to the story is, as I remember it too, and I was, uh, what was I in 70, I was about 20, 20, 21, mm. um, was that as, as the each hot burning Saharan day blended into the next and the mm. nights were hot and the mornings were hotter and et cetera, et cetera, we began to feel that all things were possible. Anything could happen. If this could happen, if the English weather could, could, could become like this, then who, who knew what might, might happen next? You know, there was, a, there was an almost a sense of magic in the air, mm. as, as well as menace. And that's, and that's what allows you, I think, to tell the story so convincingly, because this re retired old 
Codger, mm. um, who, who's been Robert. Robert, who's mm. been following his, uh, his, his, early, his, his habits of his working life. He's leaving the house at the same time as he used to leave to go to work, but this time he goes to get a paper. He goes out and gets a paper at, what is it, 6.45 every morning, mm. except on, on the day the book starts, he goes out and he doesn't come back. Mm. He disappears. And that's a great premise for the start of a, of a novel, the, a disappearance. Tell us how the storyline came to you, the plotline came to you. Well, it's funny because I decided that I wanted to write about this heat wave um, because I think it does occupy a really interesting place in Britain's psyche, you know, because the 70s was a decade of real social and political unrest. You know, there were strikes and mm. oil crises and there were four different prime ministers, you know. And right, as you say, right in the middle of it, there was this kind of beacon of optimism and excitement mm. and change and sunshine. Mm. Um, and so I, it was interesting. And I started saying to people, I'm writing about the 76 heat wave. And you know, as a novelist, it was gold dust because automatically everybody would tell me something really, often really personal about it. They would say, you know, I met a woman on a bus and she asked me what I did and I told her and I told her I was writing this and she said, oh, that was a summer I had an affair with my next door neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> it was an amazing kind of key, you know, as, as a novelist, I didn't, I, was, I rarely had to do any research. Well, Judy could have given you a story because you were, you were pregnant I with twins, pregnant, weren't you? My first, I was pregnant for the first time in my oh, life with uh, that's not my fun, twins. Not fun in the heat wave. No, it wasn't fun <laughs> and I was also working, I was working as a news reporter for Anglia Television in Norwich, oh, right. so out in this blazing sun, wow. doing uh, filing news reports, pregnant every day. And actually, I didn't find it a beacon of optimism at all. I loathed it, not just because I felt um, uncomfortable, but because... And it was all, it's just, it was the hormones, I suppose. But I mm. suddenly felt that my world was changing so much. I was about to have baby. I thought it was a baby, it turned out to be two. But, um, and I thought that the Britain's changing totally. It's becoming like Spain. You became frightened, um, didn't you? So I you actually thought, became, you thought, I thought it was never going to end. And I think a lot of people did, you know. As, as it went on before the actual thunderstorms came, which ended it, a lot yeah. of people thought, are uh, uh, fanned by the press, because they love a good scare story, yes. but they thought our climate had changed irrevocably. So you're right, everybody has a story. Yeah. Mm. Everyone has a story. So it was fascinating. And I also, around the same time, I... I met a retired police detective at a party and he was telling me that he used to work with missing persons and I told him that I've always been fascinated by the people who just exit their lives, you know, just one day get up and leave and shut the front door and I, you know, I've always been interested in what makes people do that and how do they get away with it? And, mm -hmm. Now, you and see, I thought, me, I thought reading, reading as that plot line unfolded, it's the central plot line, obviously, mm. I wondered if you, you're a bit like that. I wonder if you... If you no, seriously, <laughs> if you've had a little <laughs> fantasy about just walking out one day. I have, yeah, I've always had the fantasy, ever since I was a really young child, but actually, since I had children, I have to say, the fantasy is no longer an option. I okay. would never, I'd never do that to my kids, obviously. But um, and the policeman just said to me very casually, he said, um, the number of people who do that rises really sharply in a heat wave. Really? Yeah, and he said that when heat waves hit, the kind of police detectives brace themselves for loads Gosh. of missing persons. Did, did they have did any theories as to why? Yes. why? Well, it was funny, it was a really off-the-cuff thing, and it was in a party, and where I didn't talk to him after that, and I was really annoyed because I was walking home, and I thought, and I, the whole sort of idea for the novel started coalescing in my head, hmm. and I thought, I wish I'd talked to him a bit longer. Yeah. I didn't even know his name. But I also think as well that my own experience of that heat wave is that people start to behave in a slightly irrational manner. Yeah. Uh, it's almost as if literally their heads are turned by the heat. Yeah. Well, um, that's true because you talk about the woman who's telling you that uh, that was the summer she had an affair. I was at my first local radio station and there was a rash of office affairs. <laughs> a, a, an absolute <laughs> really? outbreak on them, yeah. So we and, to know this, and I, Well, I just arrived. <laughs> and, 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 I mean, I, I was unmarried and I was, I was fine. Fancy <laughs> free. But, um, but I remember saying to the station manager, is this normal? He said, no, it must be the heat. So yeah. how interesting that you should say. That. Anyway, to get back to the plot, um, the, obviously Robert's family gathered together, and, it's, and they had a lot of issues as a family. Um, but in the end, the hunt for him goes back to where their roots are, which, which is Ireland, yeah. which must have been lovely for you to, to go back to your own roots. Yeah, it was great. And actually, oddly enough, I realised only when I was about when I was finishing the book that I had been in that place in Connemara, where the book ends, in Omi Island, in 1976. It was a really strange ah. thing. It was like a sort of maybe a strip, because I remember talking to my mum. I said to her, when did you read Alice in Wonderland to me? Because I had this... Because remember, Alice in Wonderland starts with a, a very, very hot day. That's yes, why she right. falls yes, asleep. They're all yes. out having yeah. a picnic. Yeah, yeah. And Falling the heat asleep. is why the whole adventure happens. Yeah. So I said to her, when was it you read that to me? Because I have a memory of you telling me. And she said, oh, it would have been in 76, and we would have been staying in Connemara. And it was a very odd... I think it was almost an unconscious thing that I must have ended How up with. How interesting. There. Yeah. yeah, it was very strange. Did you, um, as you started to write, did you have the, the arc of the story complete in your head or, or, or did the story unfold as you wrote it to some extent? 
Well, I usually have a rough idea where the story will end, um, mm. but often it changes some of the mm. way through, which I quite like, though. I quite like it when your mm. characters turn around and say, actually, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go <laughs> oh, yeah. there instead. Yeah. I'm not going to go to A, I'm going to go to B. I always feel that's a point at which the book is starting to work, starting to take on Do you spend, I mean, do you, the way you write, do you, do you have a period of time before you actually start writing the book where you plot it through? Uh, so you know roughly, um, as, as Richard said, the arc of the story in, in, be, before you actually start writing the words down. Yeah, well, I think, I think all books are very different, actually, and I think each one you have to almost start from scratch, I find, to kind of keep the process fresh for yourself. But usually, yeah, I have lots and lots of notebooks and I take a lot of notes and I write down ideas and, mm. you know, I think, I think you always launch off with an idea where it, where it will end, but, you know, it usually changes. Mm. Well, it's a great read, uh, Maggie. It really is. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, and you don't have to have been alive or remember 1976 to enjoy it. Um, and for, for those people who enjoy the heat wave we had this summer, uh, 2013, um, it'll certainly put it, uh, well, what's the expression, in the shade. I suppose. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Maggie O'Farrell, Instructions for a Heat Wave. Great read. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. I'm Maggie Farrell and I'm the author of Instructions for a Heatwave. I write because I can't not write, is the answer. <laughs> I've always felt the urge, I can't remember life without it. I feel strange if I go to bed and I haven't written anything that day, even if it's just an email or a note or even a shopping list. I think the thing which I found most exciting was when I went on a residential course from the Arvon Foundation. They do week-long writing courses and I'd written about 20,000 words of actually what became my first novel. It was a real mess at the time though. Um, and I took it along and I showed it to the tutors. And the first night I was there, they both called me into the study in this very beautiful house and they said, they were sitting there very, very gravely and they looked at me and they said, um, and they turned to each other and they said, well, do you want to tell her or shall I? And I had this terrible sinking feeling. It was like being summoned to the headmistress and I thought, God, they're going to throw me off because I'm so bad. And they said, well, we think it's really good and we think you should finish it and when you have finished it, we'll send it to our agent. And that was, you know, hearing that as a 24-year-old from two writers that I really admire, they were Barbara Trapedo and Elspeth Barker, was astonishing, absolutely astonishing. So that was my real moment. In fact, I was so excited, I ran out, and it was the middle of the night, and it was very, very dark, and I ran out into the middle of nowhere, and I fell into a ditch up to my neck, filled with really nasty, icy, cold, manure-filled water. <laughs> but it was, yes, yeah, so that, that was my eureka moment. I think I write best, actually, when I don't have an awful lot of time on my hands. I think quite a lot of... The work of writing a novel is actually done away from your desk. It's not done when you're sitting there typing. It's done when you're busy doing something else, when you're looking the other way. I often find I have my best ideas when I'm busy doing something else or there'll be a kind of knot or a brick wall I've reached in the book that somehow will resolve itself if I step away from the desk and do something else. Well, I think two things, just keep going. That's the main thing. Don't look back. And also, um, you don't need to start at the beginning. I find beginnings really hard. They're always the thing that... I have to rewrite and rewrite again and again. So I think just start anywhere. Start in the middle, start halfway through, and then you can always go back and fill in the gaps. Uh, uh, Judy, I think I'm starting to peel. Here, slap on more cream, or you might end up walking down Lonely Street. Hi, I'm Deborah Mogach, and I'm the author of Heartbreak Hotel. It was too early to fortify himself in the promising-looking King's Head pub. Tonight, Jethro and the Dreamers. He pictured jovial hayseeds strumming banjos. Already he saw his own trusty mug hanging from the beams. Tell us what titles you've enjoyed on the Richard and Judy Book Club. Find us on Facebook slash Richard and Judy Book Club. <laughs>